Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good afternoon, everyone. It was good morning. 47 minutes later, it was good afternoon. And to be honest with you, there's nothing good about this afternoon. Everything has gone horribly wrong. Let me give you at least somewhat of a proper intro. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon to you. Not to me. Bad afternoon for me. Hopefully a good afternoon from you. It is Monday, April the 10th, 2023. I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas. It is currently 1231 p.m. Central Time. Now, about 1130 a.m., about 1130 a.m., we went live and we did a 47 minute broadcast. At the at that 47 minute mark, we weren't done, but the software for Spreaker just completely froze. It just stopped working. And so we weren't able to, we, in other words, it didn't even tell me like, I mean, it just froze. So basically that was the end. Everything crashed. And so that 47 minutes is gone. Now it's not gone in the sense that I was able to recover the audio, but it's gone as, well, what do I do? Do I... Do I publish 47 minutes where there's just an abrupt ending? Do I take that 47 minutes and try to come back and try to edit in some kind of a, it, it, no. So here's what we're going to do. If you listen to the last 47 minutes, I understand you can just, you can just take off and go do what you need to do because, uh, well, what we're getting ready to do is I'm getting ready to replay that 47 minute broadcast. And this live broadcast, and then at the around, uh, and when we get close to that 47 minute mark, I'm going to come in right where it crashes, offer some concluding thoughts, wrap it all up and say, there's your part three. Then we'll come back later today, this evening and do part four. And then finish this entire sermon review. I'm not going to go into explaining everything we're doing. It, I don't know if this is even going to work. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm afraid that while this is broadcasting live and I'm off doing other things like trying to find food, uh, who knows, messaging, doing whatever else I'm doing, uh, answering emails, and this is playing, my fear is <laughs> that it's going to stop working. And then it's all, and I'm going to come back up here in about 40, in about 44 minutes and go, what just happened? Yeah, 47 minutes and 46 seconds is, so that's what we're getting ready to listen to. So I hope it all makes sense. What you're here, what you're getting ready to hear is what I just did previously. This is going to play unedited un, or uninterrupted for 47 minutes. And then I'm going to come back up here right in about 47 minutes. About 46 minutes, I'm going to listen and then just try to, as soon as it crashes, I'm going to come in and offer a concluding thought, wrap it up and say, that concludes the sermon review for today and then, or for now, and then later do part four. And then it will all make sense. I hope that makes some kind of sense. I do apologize for all of this, but uh, I can't, the only other option would be just redo it all. That means I would be turning on the microphone now to just say what I just said for 47 minutes. That would be maddening. Not only that, you'd be thinking, wait a minute, did I just say it? Or did I say it in the thing that got deleted? And yeah, I don't want to do that. Or I try to take the audio, put it on another. Well, yeah, that, that, yeah, that would be all. That would be, there would be so much editing involved in that. That would just be a mess. So I'm not going to do that. So here we go. We're going to, we're going to go back way back in time, and relive that wonderful, wonderful broadcast of the Theology Central podcast that happened on April the 10th, 2023, about an hour ago. We're going to relive it because it was so good that, well, we don't want to lose it. So I'm going to replay it, and then I'll come in at the end actually live, and uh, hopefully we can put this together, and it's going to sound wonderful. Are you ready? Here we go. If you weren't listening before, oh man, you're in for a treat. Okay, <laughs> I, I guess. Uh, and if you were listening before, well, I understand if you're not going to listen again. All right, here we go. 
This happened an hour ago where we are talking about if scripture is clear, why in the world are there so many denominations? If podcasting was so easy, why why is there so many difficulties? Okay, all right, all right. Here we go. You ready? Um, that this, um, I, you know what? I'm just gonna I'm gonna back this all the way up. So you're gonna hear the intro again. I'm just gonna back this all the way up so that it makes perfect sense. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen. This occurred about an hour ago, right here on this broadcast, and you're going to hear it again. But then I'll come in at the end to make it a complete broadcast. And I make it a part three. Hey, you know, things happen. Here we go. Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good morning, everyone. It is Monday, April the 10th, 2023. It is currently 1121 a.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas. There was a slight delay there because we went live and I was like, good. And I'm like, oh, grab the iPad, grab the, is it, is it morning? Is it afternoon? Because for some weird reason, the time wasn't clear. I, the, I, I didn't have a, a clear understanding of the time, but I picked up the iPad and there it was right there. Look, 1121 AM. I mean, that is, it's right there. All I have to do is read it. It is clear. No one can misinterpret it. It says right there, 1121 AM. It gives me the date. Monday, April the 10th. Yeah, watch me. Watch me say something incorrectly. Yeah, Monday, April the 10th. It's right. But see, even if I, if there's a slight bit of confusion, if there's a slight doubt, all I have to do is just unlock the iPad and look. It's right there. In fact, I can even use the iPad. I can go over here. I can get the exact temperature right now. It's, 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 it's a chilly 70 degrees here in West Texas. We'll be up to 80 degrees later, but, but where, where, I can even tell you exactly, you know, at, at, at 2 PM, we're going to be at 76 degrees. I can get all this information. It is so clear. I can click this, click this. I can get date. I can get time. I can get the time for countries all around the world. I can get the weather for, uh, countries, states, cities all around the world. All of it's just Right there at my fingertips. It is so clear. It is right there. Underneath my iPad is a Bible. The Word of God. We as Christians, we claim it's inspired. We claim it's infallible, right? We, we, we claim all of these wonderful things about the word of God. And there is something that many Christians claim in their, th- uh, their doctrinal statements, their confessions of faith. And that is that the scriptures are clear that the scriptures are clear and can be understood not just by some elite group, not just by some magisterial authority, not just by some pope, but that anyone can take the Bible and understand it, can, can grasp its meaning. Oh, they may acknowledge that there are some parts that are difficult, but by through, you know, through a little bit of work, a little bit of study, they can obtain its meaning and anything that they actually need to know. And that, that, that is true of the farmer, of the carpenter, of the bus driver, of the convenience store clerk, all the way to the doctor, the lawyer, the, the seminary professor, that the Bible is accessible and it's, un, it's clear. There's a clarity to it that can be understood. Now, that's the claim. That is basically the the presupposition clearly coming out of the Reformation. I mean, you have to. I mean, there's no there's no debate here. The Reformation, those who 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 basically uh, Protestants, 
you know, w- w- set up a protest. They were protesting the Roman Catholic Church and they were moving away from that. They basically denied the authority of the church and claimed that the scriptures had the authority. Well, when you start claiming, no, 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 no to the, the church doesn't have the authority. The, the church doesn't judge the scriptures or stand above the scriptures. The scriptures stand and judge the church. All that preach is good. But there were some unintended consequences. And one of the things that had to happen is be like, well, well, wait, the Bible can be understood by anybody. We no longer need the church. In other words, we don't need the church to give us the authoritative scripture. We may say we need the church, but I mean, in a roundabout way, what we're saying is the church no longer has the power and the authority to say, this is what the scriptures means and scripture means, and we have to go along with it. Now we can take our Bibles And we can listen to the sermon and go, nope, you're wrong, 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 because we've got scripture. Now that sounds good. That sounds great. But to to be able to make that claim, then you have to claim the Bible has obviously a clarity to it that anyone can do this. Now, there's all kinds of unintended consequences that came from this that I don't think the reformers intended, but it ultimately happened. Basically, they said the scriptures are the final authority, but the unintended consequences is really the individual became the final authority. You can say, no, that's not true. Yes, it is. Because everyone takes the Bible, they read it, they interpret it, and then they say, that church is wrong, that church is wrong, we're not, we're going to stop going to that church, we're never going to go to that church, and you shouldn't go to that church. And so the individual becomes, so we basically gave up one pope for billions of popes. We gave up a magisterial authority so that everyone could become a magisterial authority. And people say, no, that's not true. That, look, come, that's what happened. But so fundamental to the Reformation was the idea of the clarity of Scripture, the the clarity of Scripture. Scripture is clear. uh, Scripture is clear. I think it's perspicuity of the Scriptures, if I'm saying the word correctly. I don't have the word in front of me. So, But uh, that's, that's the basic concept. It's the clarity of Scripture. This was the teaching. Now, here's the question, though. If Scripture is so clear and that anyone can understand it, and we don't need a pope, we don't need magisterial authority, but any individual can read, study, and determine what is right and what is wrong. If that is true, then why are there hundreds and thousands of different Protestant, non-Catholic groups, ministries, all saying completely different thing? If the scriptures are so clear, why is there no agreement on the word repentance? Why is there no agreement on the word baptism? Why is there no agreement on church structure? Elder-led, pastor-led, congregational-led, a hierarchy, presbyters, like how, uh, bishops, how do we under, like what, what should be the structure? There's no agreement on that. There is no agreement on salvation. Can you, can you lose it? Can you not lose it? Uh, is it monergistic or synergistic? Do we believe a Pelagian, semi-Pelagian view of, of the fall of man? Or do we, or do we have a, a more Augustinian or re- reform view? Like uh, on and on and on and on and on and on and on. There's just disagreement, disagreement disagreement. If the Bible is so clear, (laughs) then why does there appear to be so much confusion and disagreement? Now, that's what we're seeking to try to answer. And what we're doing is we're listening to a, a, I was going to say a sermon. Typically, it's a conference message, a a, a sermon, a, a lecture presented at a conference by the Gospel Coalition. I believe it's in the year 2017. It was one of their breakout sessions. And the individual we've been listening to, this is part three of our review, and I loathe part three. Um, sermon reviews, they're fun in part one because, you know, it's it's brand new. It's exciting. Part two, if we can do it very close like there's almost no delay. Maybe it's a couple of hours later. Maybe it's the very next morning that we do part two. Okay, that's pretty good because they're they're connected together. Okay, but once once we finish part two, if there's a delay, and by the time we get to part three, I, either one, I feel like okay, we've already got the idea. I think we, but we got to finish it because we don't want to be accused of taking anything out of context. And by the time you get to part three, you're like, how much do I review? How much do I not review? 
I, I just hate for some reason part threes just don't seem and typically there's a delay between part two and part three. So I, 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 I just don't like it, but we're going to finish this. All right. So is scripture actually clear? Here is my hypothesis. I believe all of the claims and all of the talk about the clarity of scripture is just wrong. I don't believe the scriptures are clear. I do not believe they are clear. I don't. I just don't. And if they, and now this is what I, I, I'm going to get emails. And I think I've already got some comments on YouTube about this. The scriptures are clear. The problem is there's so many false Christians. Oh, well that, oh, that preach is good. But of course the one posting the comments on YouTube, of course they believe they're a true Christian. So they understand the Bible because they're a true Christian and everyone else doesn't understand the Bible correctly because they're not true Christians. Well, the, it, so who gets to decide who's understanding proves whether you're saved or not saved. Then it's like, well, people don't understand the Bible because they're living in sin and they're worldly. Oh, but of course you're not living in sin and you're not worldly. It, that, that, that's just ridiculous. I, I can't stand when Christians play that little game. It comes across so arrogant. It's like, I thank thee God that I'm not like this publican. I thank thee God that I'm not like all of these heathens. I understand your word. They're all idiots. Okay. Like, I'm not, I'm not a fan of that. I don't believe it's clear. I believe that that just by it's what it is, if it's the inerrant inspired word of God, then this is God's revelation. He is, listen, infinite, eternal, all wise, right? To us who, who he's, we're finite. We're not all wise. We're not all knowing. How do we expect that we're going to be able to just take this and completely understand it correctly? And, and, and now I'm not saying we shouldn't do our best. And I'm not saying that we should pursue truth and not declare it to be true. But I think there should be a humility that goes, hmm, clearly something's wrong. 2,000 years of church history and we can't even agree on the word baptism? 2,000 years of church history, we still can't agree on the word Repentance? 2,000 years in church history, we still don't know how the church should operate. Independent, does it have to be a part, a part of a denomination? We can't even agree on that. We can't agree on salvation. We can't agree on, on basically anything. That should that should so disturb us. So we've been listening to this lecture where he attempts to say, hey, 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 scripture is clear. Oh, yes, there's all these denominations, but here's the reason why. And so he's giving us things like the reason the reason there's all these denominations is because Christians don't properly understand the sufficiency of scripture. Meaning, hey, the reason we don't, we disagree on some things is because the Bible is not sufficient to answer certain things. And we just have to realize it's only sufficient to give us this information, but not that information. Well, then who gets to determine, hey, that issue about baptism, the Bible's not sufficient to give us an answer. So we can't come up to a, do Nobody agrees on which part the Bible is sufficient to answer and not sufficient. Then he says, we don't have a proper understanding of the clarity of scripture. See, once again, the scripture is clear, but it's not clear. It's not equally clear in all parts. So there are some parts who are like, well, the Bible is not clear about that, but we can't even agree on which parts the Bible is clear or not clear. Is it clear about baptism? I think it is. I had a conversation with a group of people on a Saturday who all accused me of living in sin and that my church is in sin because the Bible is clear. You're supposed to be baptizing babies and that, and it is salvific when you baptize a baby. And if you don't understand that, you don't know, you don't know how to read your Bible. They believe it was clear. All right. Next, they say, we don't understand the sola scriptura. We don't really understand sola scriptura because here's the thing. You cannot understand your Bible according to them, apart from confessions and creeds and traditions of the church. Now, immediately when you say this, what you're telling people is like, hey, 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 Mr. Farmer, look, I know you read your Bible and I know you think you know what it means, but I'm sorry to tell you, you can't understand it unless you know all the confessions, the creeds and church history. So this begins to set up that some people will know it better than other people. Meaning, and not only that, it means the Bible, this supposedly proves the clarity of scripture. I don't know. This would prove to me the Bible is so unclear that I got to go study 2000 years of church history to understand what it means. <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever read church history, 
but I don't know. Just go, just go read the Didache, go read Tertullian on baptism, and go read Hippolytus' apostolic tradition. Okay. Just look at what those three documents have to say about baptism. You'll be like, wait a minute. This is the most convoluted. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They don't even agree with each other. But I guess that's supposedly supposed to make scripture clear. And then I think there was one more. Oh, uh, we shouldn't exaggerate. Don't. Hey, the disagreements are not really that bad. Hey, see, see, scripture is clear. I know we may have, you know, 15,000 or 5,000, whatever the number is. Okay. What? A thousand groups, because everyone's always debating on exactly how many there are. We, we may, we may have all of these groups and we have all of these different churches and we have all these different commentaries and we have all these different confessions that don't even agree with one another. But hey, 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 don't exaggerate it. See, see, the scriptures are clear. Just, hey, don't look over there. Oh, hey, yeah, but there's another church split happening. There's another denomination falling apart. There's all these d- churches leaving this denomination. Shh. Don't exaggerate the the differences. See, we're really unified. Don't exaggerate it. Yeah, okay, whatever. All right, so that's where we are. Let's finish this. Are you ready? On this Monday. Man, I wish everything was clear as the iPad makes it. I just pick it up and go, oh, there's the date. There's the time. It's 1135 a.m. Central Time. It's Monday, April the 10th. I wish I could open my Bible and go, oh, that's what I'm supposed to believe about baptism. Oh, that's what I'm supposed to believe about salvation. Oh, that's what we're supposed to believe about the church. I'm about to drop, drop my Bible. I, oh, that's that's what we're supposed to believe, uh, you know, and re, uh, about whatever the subject may be. The church, marriage, whatever. Divorce. Well, we, the church doesn't even agree on divorce. Okay. I don't know if the church agrees on any. The only thing the church agrees on, I think, is secular music is bad. Lord of the Rings is good. And sex. Shh. We don't talk about it. I think that's about, I think that's about all the church agrees on. The Lord of Rings, the greatest thing that's ever been. I mean, if you question the Lord of the Rings, you're not even saved. Well, I can't stand Lord of the Rings, but I, this is how Christianity works. Secular mu- music, bad. We only listen to Christian music. And of course, sex. Shh. Okay. All right. All right. Maybe that's a little bit of exaggeration and hyperbole, but you get the idea. You ready to finish this review? I'm not. <laughs> because at this point, I feel that all this has led to is a lack of clarity. It hasn't proven the clarity of anything. But okay, here we go. I got to get my notes ready. Don't. Does that irritate you or ignore? Or does that, how does that? I used to love, now, I don't, I didn't always agree with his politics, but no one can deny that Rush Limbaugh could turn on a microphone and speak for three hours and keep you intrigued and listening. Even he didn't need to take phone calls. He didn't need to do interviews. It was just Rush, a microphone and three hours, right? And it was, it was, it was always fascinating. It's hard to believe that he, he died, but okay. But he, he definitely did this a lot. Right. He would he would do make the sound of the of the note. And I always loved it. And sometimes you could hear his printer printing out whatever he was the article he was getting ready to read. But I always liked that idea that I could hear the paper. I could just picture him. Then if, later on, he did the video camera thing, which I never liked to watch. I love audio because I can picture it in my mind. But I could just see Here's the news article he's getting ready to report. Um, and uh, so I don't know. I have a tendency to just grab the paper and do that and probably irritate you. But you know what? That's not really clear, right? That's subjective because you may like it. I may love it. Well, yeah, there we go. I don't know. Just threw that in just for extra. Here we go. We're going to just jump in. I don't have this queued up perfectly. He's getting ready to review, but he's getting ready to say something about Peter uh, and talking about Paul, that some things Paul writes is hard to understand. So therefore, Peter is saying, well, see, clearly there's some things that are clear to understand that can be understood. You know, well, great, but yeah, here we go. It demonstrates that Peter knew there was a right and wrong interpretation of Paul, even when it was difficult to understand. So we need a proper understanding of the sufficiency of the clarity. Here's the third point. We need a proper understanding of sola scriptura. We do not interpret scripture apart from creed. 
Now, I backed this up probably a little too far, but we're going to just let this play so that we can kind of get through here. I, I, I probably could have, I could have, I probably backed it up too far, but that's okay. I'm not going to do a lot of interrupting this. Just make sure on, on this point, what he's ultimately going to say is you cannot properly understand scripture apart from creeds, confessions, and the tradition of the church. Which then basically tells people, hey, 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 you want to understand your Bible? You got to demonstrate to me that you're studying all of these other documents. And if the Bible is so clear, why do we need the other documents? All right. And why do, why, if you go in church history, how much disagreement there is in church history? Okay, I, I, I digress. Here we go. Eats, confessions, and the traditions of the church. It is not solo scriptura, meaning scripture and we never open another book. Some of you maybe come from churches or perhaps you even think this yourself and you might say, there is no creed but the Bible. Sounds nice, sounds spiritual, and it actually sounds like a creed. We believe in the Bible and our creed, no creed but the Bible. No, we are willing humbly to climb on the shoulders of giants and to learn from what those who have gone before have taught. Just remember my perspective on this. I get so tired of, of this sanctimonious, we, stand, we humbly stand on the shoulders of giants and learn from those in church history. No, you don't. You go to church history to find those who agree with you. That's what we do. Because when you say, who are you going to agree with in church history? You're going to agree with Pelagius? You're going to agree, agree with Origen? You're going to agree with Athanasius? You're going to agree with, and we can just go on and on and on and on and on. Who, who, who are you going to agree with? And in many cases, even one church father. Oh, we, we love Augustine. Oh, when he, he sounds very reformed and, and, you know, like a Calvinist. Oh, we love, but when Augustine basically sounds like a Roman Catholic, well, like, how dare he? No, we, he's wrong. So, so we only stand on the shoulders of giants when they agree with us. And when they don't agree with us, we cast them to the side. So then really, Who's the authority? Oh, we are still the authority. So, I, I, I lot now. By no means am I dismissing the study of church history. I just think we need to be a little bit more honest what we do with it. When we studied three historical documents: the Didache, Tertullian on baptism, and the Apostolic Tradition by Hippolytus. What did we do? We we're like, what in the world is this stuff? Baptize people in the nude? I don't think so. So immediately we just start throwing out what we disagree with. Now, what some people will say, no, 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 no. We, we, the, the, we only agree with the church fathers as they agree with scripture. No, you only agree with the church fathers when they agree with your interpretation of scripture. <laughs> I've heard charismatics quote the church fathers. I've heard Catholics quote the church fathers. I've heard Protestants quote the church fathers. I've heard Greek Orthodox quote the church fathers. And everyone quotes the church fathers and say, see, we're right. <laughs> yeah. Because anytime we don't agree with them, they're wrong and we don't need them anymore. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. And have understood we ought to put the burden of proof on those who would overturn the historic consensus of the church, whether it's related to sexuality or to the deity of Christ. We aren't assigning ourselves to utter interpretation. And I love that. We have, to, we have to basically submit ourselves to the historical consensus of the church. The historical consensus of the church. Was Luther agreeing with the historical consensus of the church? Was he agreeing with the majority of the church when he basically said, nope, scripture alone? Was he agree? Catholics would argue that he wasn't agreeing with the, the historical consensus of the church. Others, in other words, we can't even agree what the historical consensus of the church was. <laughs> And I say, well, the, 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 these councils were good. And then you go through all the things that those councils said, whether the, say you go with the most Protestants will accept the first six ecumenical councils, but for some weird reason, we will reject the seventh. Now we say the six or seven, if we're not counting, counting the council of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, we can get into a whole discussion about that, but we, we, there, there'll be, I don't agree with the council there. I don't agree with the, wait a minute. What about the historical consensus? And how is the average Christian supposed to figure out the historical consensus? 
Hey, you can't understand the Bible until you ensure that you're in agreement with the historical consensus of the church. How do they get that? Oh, they listen to pastor. Tell them what the historical consensus of the church is. But pastors don't agree on what the historical consensus of the church is. So then how does that? Oh, this this is going to help us with clarity of scripture. We just got to figure out what the historical consensus of the church was. But what was the historical consensus of the church? Presbyterians will tell me it's baptizing babies. But is it possible the historical consensus of the church was wrong? Right? I mean, like, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. If chaos, we aren't claiming to start all over. We are willing to learn and rely on others. This is always the fatal flaw in restorationist movements in church history. Those movements who say, you know what, I'm just, just, I'm just getting back to the Bible, just me and the Bible, nothing else. I'm just zipping back to the first century like nothing has happened for 2,000 years, like I'm not at all influenced by my own culture, like I have nothing to learn from Athanasius or Augustine or Luther or Calvin or any of the Christians that have gone before, as if the Holy Spirit... It's just funny. He picks all the people in church history that probably he would agree with. <laughs> what about all the all their contemporaries who was arguing against them? <laughs> right? <laughs> right? What about them? Well, that don't count. That don't count. Oh, so, and not only that, even with those he mentioned, I guarantee you, if they deviate with what he thinks is right or his interpretation of scripture, then he won't go with them. Spirit has not been at work in the church, and I'm just going back, me and the Bible. Even if that were desirable, it is not possible. Sola Scriptura does not mean there is no authority other than the Bible. We acknowledge the authority of parents, of government. We submit ourselves to the authority of elders. In some traditions, you may support, you know, submit yourself to the authority of a uh, presbytery or an assembly. What we confess is that Scripture is the ultimate and the final authority. So, sola scriptura does. If we're honest, what we confess is our interpretation of Scripture is the ultimate and final authority. Nobody wants to admit that, but it is. Because everyone goes to the Bible and says, this is what the Bible says. It's authoritative. No, you, your interpretation is authoritative. And then you tell me if I don't agree with your, uh, your interpretation, then I'm wrong. And then I go read the Bible. I'm like, no, no, no. Here's the interpretation. It's we make our interpretation authoritative. I don't know why we can't just say what the reality is. The reality makes us uncomfortable. And we're like, no, 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 no. It shouldn't be that way. I understand we don't want it. We, we say it shouldn't be that way. But it's just the way it is. I don't, I wish it was not true. I wish I could say the Bible is the ultimate authority. I want it to be the ultimate authority. I do. But it really comes down to person A reads it. Covenant theology is right. Person B reads it. Dispensational theology is right. Person A reads it and go, Israel is done. It was replaced by the church. Person B reads it and says, absolutely not. God is not done with Israel. All of those promises will be fulfilled to Israel, literal. Another person reads it and says, no, no, no. Those promises to Israel were given to the church and they're fulfilled spiritually. Some people read Matthew 24 and go, that is, that is signs for the future. Others read Matthew 24 and go, no, 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 no. Those are signs leading up to 70 AD. Some say a preterist is right. Some, we can go on and on. Some say baptize babies. Others say don't baptize babies. Some say baptism is required for salvation. Others say baptism isn't required for salvation. Some people say you can lose your salvation. Others say you can't lose your salvation. Some people say you, you're that uh, God elected uh, those who would say. Others say, no, we're, we're saved by free will. Others would say there's a limited atonement. Others say, no, there's a universal atonement. I could just go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Now we can say, no, the scriptures are the authority. Obviously, what becomes the authority is your interpretation of it. And then the minute you think someone is wrong, you just like peace out, boom, go, go into another church. does not mean we have nothing to learn from anything else except the Bible. 
It means in the end, everything, all our traditions, all our historical formulations, all our creeds and confessions and man-made catechisms, they all must be tested against the supreme authority of the Bible. Now, this is maddening to me, right? So all, so we're supposed to study all of this stuff to give us clarity to the scriptures because he's, his whole argument is the scriptures are clear, but they can't be clear apart from all of these things. But after we learn all of these things, then we're supposed to test them by the scriptures. Well, if the scriptures are so clear that I can test 2,000 years of church history and determine who's right and who's wrong, then why do I need them in the first place? If I'm the one who's supposed to read Augustine, I mean, like right here, where is it? Where is my book? Where is it? Um, it's somewhere. Hang on. Let me look. Let me look. Oh, here we go. The Apostolic Fathers. 280, 280, 89 pages. Now, look, I think everyone should read the Apostolic Fathers. I think everyone should read all the Church Fathers. I think everyone should be study, students of church history. But I say we study church history just to know what they were doing and what they were thinking. I don't believe that they're going to necessarily provide us any more clarity to Scripture. I, I One Wednesday night at my church, I read a commentary from one of the Church Fathers. And by the time I was done, everybody was like, don't ever do that again. It was just... It was the most nonsensical mess I had ever read in my life. It was so allegorical. Like, you know, a donkey walked three miles. Well, you know, a donkey represents this and three represents this and miles represents. Th and it was like, it was insanity. It was absolute total insanity. And, and people were like, no, no, it's garbage. Okay. Well, so then wait a minute. So you're telling me that the scriptures are clear. The problem is we don't read the Bible in light of all of that history and tradition. However, we read all of that history and tradition, but then we have to judge it by scripture to determine if they were right or wrong. Well, wait a minute. Well, then that would mean scripture is that they're not helping me understand the Bible. I'm reading them so that I can judge them by the Bible, meaning then the Bible is clear. So then you can't tell me like, this is just so weird circular reasoning. Wait, if the Bible is clear, why do we have all these denominations? Well, see, the problem is, is the Bible is clear, but we, we, it's only clear if we read it with all of this church history in mind. But wait a minute. We're supposed to judge all of that church history by the Bible alone. Well, that means the Bible then is clear. I can't be, I'm going to read Augustine to understand the Bible, but I'm going to read the Bible in order to judge Augustine. Well, wait a minute. If Augustine is the one helping me understand the Bible, how then I can turn around and judge him by the Bible alone when I needed Augustine to understand the Bible in the first place? <laughs> that, would, that would mean the Bible is so clear that I can, ju I can judge Augustine. So I don't need Augustine to help me understand the Bible, considering I'm the one who's getting ready to be judging Augustine. Or anybody else in church history, Pelagius, anybody else, Sabalius, we can go through all the different people, Hippolytus, Tertullian, Ignatius, we can go on and on and on and on and on through all the people in, in, uh, in church history. That, that's just, I don't know how this supposedly fixes his, I don't know how this is supposed to help anything. Well, not solo scriptura, or some people said not nuda scriptura, but sola, the final arbiter of what is true. Fourth, fourth response to this question of pervasive interpretive pluralism. We need a proper understanding of the history of the church. The church has been around for 2,000 years, and so of course you will find examples of Christians believing wrong things. I mean, that should not be a hard endeavor. You have 2,000 years of material. It is not difficult. You have millions, if not billions of people who have been Christians throughout these centuries. You are going to find people who believe wrong things, who have said silly things. But sometimes the press is not quite as bad as we are led to believe. Columbus, for example, was not actually the first person to think that the world... Now, I, I call this, don't exaggerate, he calls it the history of the church. We have, to, we have to know the history of the church, I guess, to understand the Bible, but then he turns around and immediately says, but hey, there's been people who've been wrong. 
Well, then if people have been wrong in history, how do I know they're wrong? Because I'm using scripture to judge them. So then how is history helping me clarify the scripture? And if this if the scripture is clear, why do I need that in order to make it? I don't even understand. It's just this big circular reasoning. Hey, the Bible is clear, but why is it not clear? Well, because we don't understand this and we don't understand this and we need the history. But guess what? All these people were wrong in history. Well, how do we know we're wrong? Well, the Bible. What? Wait a minute. I thought I needed them to make the Bible clear. Well, I thought, is the Bible clear? I don't know if the Bible is clear, but I know this. I can judge them. Well, then that means the Bible is clear. And if the Bible is clear, Why are we judging all these people wrong? Why did they get it wrong if the Bible was clear? Is it just clear to me or was it clear to them? Because when, as soon as I tell someone that they were wrong, they'll tell me that I'm wrong. So is the Bible clear or not clear? This, this is his argument is that the Bible is clear, but then he tells us we need all of these things to make sure the Bible is clear. However, then the Bible is clear enough for us to judge them. But he still hasn't explained if the Bible is clear, why do we have all these denominations, I, it, it's, it's such, I, I don't, I, I don't really know how to even show you all the circular reasoning going on here. World was round. The venerable Bede in the seventh century taught that the world was round as did the Bishop of Salzburg and Hildegard of Bingham and Thomas Aquinas, all whom are saints in the Catholic church. I only point that out because sometimes that's thrown at you. Well, it was, you know, all the church for years and years. Yeah, all those people who were saints in the Catholic Church, which you would say are wrong. <laughs> and you would say those saints were wrong. <laughs> so I, I don't, I, were they wrong because Scripture was clear? Or were they wrong because Scripture wasn't clear? Or they're wrong because you say they're wrong? Because you think a scripture is clear, but they would say that you're wrong based on that because scripture is clear or cl- cl- clearly I don't know anymore. They, they all thought that the, the earth was flat. So how can we trust you? Well, that's not accurate. Every educated person in Columbus's day knew the earth was round. It took Jeffrey Burton Russell to argue that during the first 15 centuries of the Christian era, that the nearly unanimous scholarly opinion pronounced the earth spherical, and by the 15th century, all doubt had disappeared. Sphere was the title of the most popular medieval textbook on astronomy written in the 13th century. So the sundry wise men of Spain who challenged Columbus did so on account of their belief in the earth's size, not in its flatness. They thought Columbus had underestimated the circumference of the earth, which he most definitely had. All of that is just an example because some of these popular myths get handed down. Well, that was the church. The church was benighted. The church was backwards. And they all opposed Columbus because they thought he was going to fall off the edge of this flat earth because they were reading their Bibles and saw that the sun rose and the sun set. Recall, too, that on almost any of these scientific questions, the scientific community was wrong for at least as long as the church may have been wrong, whether it's on where the plague came from, or spontaneous generation, or geocentrism. And even where the church has been wrong, for example, on the issue of slavery in the 19th century South in particular. Now, again, the people who he's saying were wrong would have been saying that they were right based off Scripture. He says they were wrong. But he, 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 I always find it funny when we, when we do these lessons about, hey, the scriptures are clear and people are, and, and the reason people get it all wrong is because this, 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 and this, and this. It's always us saying that they are wrong. But what, who, who gets to decide who's wrong? Now, again, when I, when I point these things out, Christians get really nervous, like I'm calling for some kind of theological relativism. I am not. I just can't stand us denying that it's like, well, wait a minute. I'm saying I'm right based off Scripture. They're saying they're right based off Scripture. Yet we're going to maintain the Scripture is clear. Yet 2,000 years clearly demonstrates it's not clear because nobody can agree. And then we try to accuse that the reason those people get it wrong is because they're not godly or blah, 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 blah. But of course, we always think we're right. It's just like, how do you not see how utterly insane it all looks? 
Now, I do believe that we have to get back to Scripture alone and that we have to get back to reading it and memorizing it and studying it. And study is more observation than is interpretation. I wish Christians would get back to more observational study way before they and stop and slow way down on the interpretation. I wish and I think that there are a lot of practical problems here. His solution here is just like, well, I mean, other people were wrong. (laughs) So, so we, wouldn't we predict them to be wrong because they don't have the revelation from God? I'm like, I don't know what that supposedly proved. Well, other people were wrong. And I mean, Christians were wrong too, but I mean, you know, we don't want to exaggerate how wrong they were. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I can just go to basic things that Christians can't agree on. It wasn't wrong for century after century. And even when it was wrong... It eventually got to a point where it could find what was right. To people who use the slavery argument, which is perhaps the most common argument, well, that's just your interpretation, and didn't Christians for the longest time believe that the Bible supported slavery? One of the things you say in response is, okay, some Christians did believe that the Bible supported chattel slavery, but you seem very clearly to know now that the Bible doesn't. And so you seem to have arrived at at an interpretation that you think we all ought to agree on. And you could even press further and say, well, if, if we were reading our Bibles, you would see that the Bible teaches that stealing people, man stealing, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, was forbidden. So the Bible condemned the whole practice of chattel slavery as it existed in the transatlantic slave trade. So we need to have, those are just two examples, we need to have a better understanding of history and we need to not be so scared and so, you know, cowering in a corner when people throw at these things, which they probably have spent all of 30 seconds thinking about. Of course, he, you know, anyone who brings up any of these issues is because they've only given 30 seconds of thought to it. Yeah, so, you know. Hey, hey, he's got it all figured out. Anybody else who calls it into question, they just because they didn't give 30 seconds of thought to it. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Got to love that. Fifth, we must not exaggerate our differences. We must not exaggerate our differences. Certainly, some groups of professing Christians disagree on fundamentals of the Christian faith. And it seems as if we hardly agree on the same faith at all. But if you were to take Christians and churches and denominations that believe the same thing about the Bible, so we have the same foundation about the Bible, and you take those attributes of Scripture, which you can remember with the acronym SCAN, Scripture is sufficient, Scripture is clear, Scripture is authoritative, Scripture is necessary, SCAN. If you were to get Christians and churches and denominations who agree on that, we agree the Bible is perfect. What I find hilarious, in some ways, he's called that whole thing into question. Because I guess you can't really understand the Bible unless you go read all of church history. However, you're the one who then judges church history. I don't know. All right. So he's saying now, look, we don't want to exaggerate. We don't want to exaggerate the problem. So if we'll get churches who will all will agree with this about the Bible, then we won't have a problem. So what you have to do is you have to then eliminate a whole lot of churches. But those churches that you would try to eliminate would say that the reason that they hold to their view is because of the Bible. Right? So I don't know. It's like, well, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We've got to limit the number of people so that we can lessen the disagreements. That, 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 I find that hilarious. All right, here we go. Let's continue. Perfect. We agree that it's God's revelation. We agree it's breathed out. We agree it's inerrant. You get those Christians, Christians like I imagine are the ones in this room. I think that there would still be, we know there would still be disagreements, but I think we would also find that we have much, much more in common than what would separate us. And the things that unite us are the things that are most foundational and most fundamental. So go back to the the numbers I gave earlier. I bet out of those 27 Baptist denominations, 20 of them are some form of evangelical. And of those 20, I bet they believe the same things about the Trinity. 
about the person of Christ and the atonement and heaven and hell and original sin and the resurrection and faith and repentance and probably a dozen other things that are most essential to our faith as Christians. Again, I, I'm not going to go back to this because we've reviewed some of this. I'm trying to add new thoughts here. You can listen to what I said in part two. Got a Baptist church right down the street. They're so charismatic. Don't believe in total depravity. I mean, come on. Baptists, the Baptists are all over the place. Free will, Calvinistic, uh, Pelagian, semi-Pelagian, Augustinian. I mean, give me a break. That's just ridiculous. Baptists are all over the place. Why do we have different denominations? Well, there's many different reasons. It's not always that Christians got together and they couldn't agree on a specific interpretation. It's not always because of schism or heresy. Sometimes it's because of different ethnicity. And it's not always a sign that one race or ethnicity was opposed to another. There's different historical reasons. Perhaps, you know, in the African-American community, it was an oppressed community, and so they had to, by necessity, build up their own churches. Or with the waves of immigrants that came from Europe, there were Dutch Reformed churches, and there were Swedish Free Churches, and there were German Lutheran churches, and those have maintained different denominational homes. Not necessarily because they all disagree on the most fundamental matters of the faith, if they're evangelicals, but because there's some historical continuity. And when they first came to this country, they maybe spoke the mother tongue, and it took some time before they learned English. So there's all sorts of historical reasons, different rates of Americanization, different languages, different regions of the country, different traditions worth perpetuating, perhaps a, a different confessional standard that they were, they were fond of. All that to say, when you hear those statistics of how many hundreds or thousands of denominations, that doesn't mean by necessity, and none of those Christians agree on anything important. I, I mean, it's such a cop-out. To me, that's such a cop-out. You can't get Christians to agree on the word repentance. You can't them, get them to agree on the word baptism. You can't them, get them to agree on how the church should be structured. You can downplay it all day. Even even he downplayed the differences among Baptist denominations. Look, I've been a Baptist basically my whole life other than, well, my whole salvation life, other than the time I, I the, the for the period of time I was a Lutheran. But for crying out loud, I've seen everything from, you name it. I mean, I've seen everything from hardcore Arminian to hardcore Calvinist. I've seen everything from hardcore fundamentalist to more liberal. I've seen every kind. I've seen uh, charismatic type Baptist. I've seen everything. Yeah, like, and, and there's just constant not agree. And how many Baptist churches have you seen split even amongst themselves because they fight and can't get along? It's It's just... How many people are a Baptist and then are, are a part of a Baptist church and then leave that Baptist church because they disagree with that church? Or they've all, you know, filed out in their different denominations because of pervasive interpretive pluralism. There are many historical reasons. There really is a mere Christianity, a core deposit of apostolic orthodoxy that has been taught, defended, and promoted over 2,000 years. Think about some of the hymns that you sing. And, and I hope that you sing new songs in your church because we don't believe that the last good song to Jesus has already been written. And I hope you lean heavily into old songs. Because if you just sing the new songs that 90% of them nobody's going to be singing in 15 years. I was going to break into shine, Jesus, shine. But I don't mean to make fun of them. I'm just saying it was good. It served the Lord and his generation and that's it. When you sing those old hymns of the Father's love begotten from the 4th century. When you sing the hymns of Watts and Wesley. When you sing Martin Luther. When you sing some of the good hymns. When you sing the hymns of Watts and Wesley and Luther, well, well, let's take the theology of Watts, Wesley, and Luther. Is there, I don't know how this is supposed to show the clarity of Scripture. Well, well, take some of those hymn writers and then compare all of their theology. Is there agreement? Does this somehow prove the Scripture is clear? I don't, I don't know in any way, shape, or form how that fixes anything. To me, that doesn't. That doesn't fix anything. And with that, 
Well, I'm back live. I'm back live. You've just been listening to about 53 minutes of, well, what I did the last hour and then everything crashed. So I wanted to play that again and then come in and try to wrap this up in some kind of meaningful way. Now, what I'm going to do, all right, now this is not going to be perfect. See, I was just going to wrap it up right here and just say those comments about that. I mean, I mean, look, you just spent 57 minutes. I'm sorry, 54 minutes listening to all of his attempting to try to show you scripture is clear. It's circular reasoning, contradicting itself. It's just a mess. There's not much more I can add to it. So I was just going to kind of say, all right, that concludes part three. But what I'm going to do before we conclude part three, and then we'll finish up this review. We're going to definitely finish it up tonight. I don't care if it's at 11 o'clock tonight, but I'm, I've got the audio here of this thing. And I'm going to try to find out where we stopped. Where did we stop? We stopped it with him talking about the hymns. I'm going to go back see and see if we can find it, all right? So um, this is going to be a little start and stop, start and stop until we can get it queued up exactly where we stopped. And then maybe if we can find where we stopped before we run out of time, I'm going to try to stop this right at the top of the hour or, or at the 60 minute mark. Um, if we can find it, we'll let that play out. We'll back it up a little bit. Maybe we'll go a little bit over an hour. Um, but if I can't find it, then we'll just give up. But uh, So this is going to be a little picking and choosing, but that's okay. Let's, let's see. Let's just mute the mic and see if we can find it. Rethinking the rethinking on Lee. Like, there's all this scholarly literature on people going back and forth, very smart people with PhDs, on whether Lincoln was a good president or not. It seemed to be obvious. Over 2,000 years. Think about some of the hymns that you sing. And, and I hope that you sing new songs in your church because we don't believe that the last good song to Jesus has already been written. And I hope you lean heavily into old songs because if you just sing the new songs that 90% of them nobody's going to be singing in 15 years. I was going to break into Shine, Jesus, Shine, but I don't mean to make fun of them. I'm just saying it was good. It served the Lord and its generation, and that's it. When you sing those old hymns of the Father's love begotten from the fourth century, when you sing the hymns of Watts and Wesley, when you sing Martin Luther, when you sing some of the good hymns of the 19th century, and there's a few good ones there, uh, you realize that there is this core of... Please note, there was a couple of good ones there. So wait, he's going to he's going to say some of the hymns weren't good. Well, wait a minute. I thought, wait, I thought scripture was clear. If scripture was clear, all the hymn writers, all these writing spiritual songs, shouldn't there then be agreement and all of the theology? How can he just insinuated Well, there were some good ones in the 19th century, meaning that the 19th century was filled with lots of bad ones? Well, are they bad because you say they're bad? And if they're bad, why were they bad? Because isn't scripture clear? Remember, he's trying to demonstrate the scripture is clear and answer if scripture is clear. Why are there so many denominations? He's not even come close to answering this problem. He's not even come close. And again, if so, why, why, why were like, oh, these hymns were good, but he only picked out the hymns that he thinks are good. What about the hymns that others think are good? And if you took all of those hymn writers together, they would all uh, argue that they wrote their hymns based off scripture, but he would say that they got it wrong and they would say, so how does this prove it? Like all he's doing is taking us down more and more paths to demonstrate the absolute lack of clarity in scripture because no one can agree on anything. See, I think we should start with, obviously scripture isn't clear because nobody can agree on anything in 2000 years. He says that's an exaggeration. I can demonstrate over and over and over that's true. So, so then maybe we should say maybe scriptures aren't as clear. Hmm. All right, so what do we do? His argument is like, it's clear because look at all these hymns. I mean, there were some bad ones, but 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 I, I don't know how this proves anything. Right? Let, let's, let's take this a little further, right? Since now we're back live, let, let's see if we can get this a little closer to where we can finish it up to, uh, this evening. Apostolic truth, which has had been passed on. So let us not overemphasize the differences that we have across denominations or even across the centuries. Six. I find that whole, let's not overemphasize the differences of denominations. 
The fact there's different denominations. I don't have to overemphasize the difference. The fact there's different denominations is because there is a difference. Why is there? Remember, his whole point was, if scripture is clear, why are there so many denominations? His argument is, well, just don't overemphasize the differences. (laughs) Hey, I know there's all these denominations, but let's just not, let's not worry about why there's all these denominations. But I thought you were going to try to explain why there's all these denominations if scripture is clear. Maybe the reason there's all these denominations Because it's not as clear as we want to pretend that it is. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. All right. He's going to give us his next point. He's going to give us his his next point. I'm going to back this up just a little bit. All right. Here we go. We should recognize that pervasive interpretive pluralism has always been a problem and is still Wait a minute here. I don't know exactly. Let's see where I think we may have went too far. Here we go. For anyone in any field of human inquiry. So I don't know how you, how you grew up and how, what you learned. All right. We, we got to back this up. I don't know. I, I, I wanted to move it back just a little bit and I ended up going too far. I think let's go back here. Let's try here. Here we go. This is not just a problem for Protestant Christians. Okay, I I don't know how this is an answer. I think I see what he's getting ready to try to do. Hey, it's not just our problem. I don't know how that fixes anything. All right, here we go. Has always been a problem and is still a problem for everyone. Okay, this, okay. I got to figure out where exactly he starts making this point. All right, here we go. And is still a problem. I can't get it past that point. All right, here we go. Here we go. Let's go here. Let's go to 2713. All right, here we go. We have across denominations or even across the centuries. Sixth response. We should recognize that pervasive interpretive pluralism has always been a problem and is still a problem for everyone, everywhere. This is really important. The, the first- this is crazy to me. All right, so if the Bible is clear, why are there so many interpretations? Why is there this persuas- per- pervasive interpretive pluralism? Why is there this pervasive interpretive pluralism if Scripture is clear? And now his argument is, well, it's always been this way. It's a problem for everyone. Well, how does this answer the problem? I don't know. We, we, oh, I know we're at 60. I know we're at an hour. We, we, we got to take this a little further. First five points are important, and you maybe have some categories for those theologically. This one should be a matter of common sense, but I think we don't consider it enough. This is not just a problem for Protestant Christians. This is a problem for a group of people we can call human beings. This is an issue for anyone in any field of human inquiry. So I don't know how you, how you grew up and how, what you learned about history in your classes. And if you're from this country, how you were taught the Civil War, war between the states, War of Northern Aggression, I've heard. Okay, I know a lot of different names. Okay, so we learned Civil War, grew up in Michigan. And, um, you know, I'm moving to North Carolina, so maybe i got to change this illustration. But I, I never heard anyone say anything bad ever about Abraham Lincoln. Just never. Just in school, that was just, what do you, what do you know? You know that the Bible is true and Abraham Lincoln was a good president. That was just sort of... You just, I mean, he, he, was, he was always the hero. And so I remember years ago getting into a conversation with a thoughtful person in my church, and Abraham Lincoln was the bad guy for him. It was a governmental overreach and all the things that he did, and it led to big government. You can, 
And so I, I so reading some books on Abraham, and I, I read a whole book on rethinking Lincoln. I wrote, read, read books that were rethinking the rethinking on Lincoln. At least there's all this scholarly literature on people going back and forth, very smart people with PhDs, on whether Lincoln was a good president or not. It seemed to be obvious to me for my whole life, and now I'm confused about even that. I, I don't understand how this helps. You're talking about people... You're talking about people arguing all of these different things to somehow prove because nobody can agree on anything that you shouldn't expect the Christians to agree on anything. But yet the Bible is clear. So because non-Christians can't agree on anything, then you shouldn't expect the Christians to agree on everything. But yet the Bible is clear. So his his and his question was. If the Bible is clear, why are there so many denominations? And his answer is, is because, well, human beings never agree on anything anyway. So it has nothing to do with the clarity of Scripture. So Scripture is absolutely clear. But Christians, well, because we're just humans, we're never going to agree. Well, but for Christians, the argument is, but we have one source of authority. If you're arguing over Lincoln, well, nobody, who's the authority? Where is the source of authority? That, isn't that what we always argue as Christians? The problem with the world is because they don't have a source of authority. The problem with the world is everyone has their own authority and everyone just, there's never going to be agreement. But us as Christians, we've got one source of authority. But now he's saying that even if you have one source of authority, doesn't really matter. You're going to be just like the people in the world. World, not agreeing on anything. So having one source of authority is of no value. He's basically making an argument. Having scripture alone is really of no value because as human beings, we're not going to agree anyway. So no matter how clear scripture is or how clear, how clear scripture isn't, well, doesn't matter because we're not going to agree anyway. So we're just going to be like people arguing over whether Lincoln was a good or bad president. Pervasive interpretive pluralism. I remember my physics teacher in high school trying to, to drill into us in our AP physics class. It was very helpful. He said, w- w- if you remember nothing else, just remember when you get out there and whenever you hear some reports about what science says, and this is a physics teacher, a scientist, he said, let me just tell you, probably don't trust it. Now, it wasn't because he didn't trust scientific inquiry or the scientific method. He just said, the, the, the way that science works, it, somebody puts out a thesis or a hypothesis and it gets in this journal and then it gets, you know, bounced around for a number of years and then it gets changed and tweaked. But of course, you, you, you never hear about it later. You just hear about, well, butter's terrible. Well, margarine's terrible. Well, you need a little sugar. No, you need no sugar. You need no red meat. No, all you should eat is red meat. No, you should go out and kill the animals themselves and be totally paleo and just do it. You should eat grass, kill animals, and don't use sugar, and you'll live forever. So, even... So, hey, Christians, don't worry about all of our differences. Don't worry that we can't agree on anything. Don't worry that there's pervasive interpretive pluralism within Christianity, because, hey, look over there. Look, look at the world. They have pervasive interpretive pluralism. See? See how stupid they look? Well, hey, hey, so so don't worry about ours. But wait a minute. They don't have one source of authority. I, I, I don't know how... Per, be, basically, his argument is, the Bible is clear. Why is there so many denominations? Because pervasive interpretive pluralism is just the way the world works in the church, outside the church, Christian, non-Christian, Muslim, Mormon, atheist, agnostic, Satanist. That's just the way we are. So just expect, just accept it. Pervasive interpretive pluralism is the norm. That is his answer to pervasive interpretive pluralism inside the church. Science, and, and real scientists who study, they, they understand that there is pervasive interpretive pluralism. I read several books after the housing crisis in 2008 because I like to read stuff. And there were dozens of explanations for that. I uh, was born in Chicago, so I've always been a Chicago White Sox fan. Ooh, yeah, okay, I know. I know, the Cubs, the Cubs. Yeah, every, every century or so, it's good. 
No, they're very good, and most of my family are Cubs fans, so I'm, I, I, I can support it to a degree. But I, I read a, you know, I've read books on the 1919 Black Sox scandal with Shoeless Joe Jackson, and you've seen Field of Dreams. Some of you, well, there's all sorts of theories on what he knew or didn't know, and how could he have agreed to this, and he didn't even write, and he should be in the hall. It doesn't matter. Almost whatever you read on, whatever you're interested in, if you get deep enough into it and you start reading widely, you find pervasive interpretive pluralism. It is in every academic field, every area of human inquiry, every family. The problem is not with the Bible. It is with our finitude as human beings. And then you mix into it that none of us just approaches things just, you know, just very calmly and coolly. And we, we'd like to think we're all just, you know, just Now, I want to make it clear. I don't believe there's a problem in the Bible. I don't. I just don't believe it is clear as he he wants to argue the Bible is clear. The Bible is clear. So the problem isn't the Bible. The problem is I don't believe that problem. I don't believe saying the Bible isn't clear is saying there's a problem in the Bible. I don't think that that's saying there's a problem. I just think it's not as clear as we claim that it is. And even if it's as clear as he claims it is, what ma- what does it matter if it's clear? Because he's just now basically said, hey, guys, pervasive interpretive pluralism, just expect it. That's just the way it is. OK, so the way it is is, hey, we can't fix it because that's just the way it is. How do you fix the fact that for 2000 years, Christians can't agree on baptism, repentance? I mean, basically anything. Oh, well, you know, well, that's just the way it is. Pervasive interpretive plural. Why, why do an entire conference to explain or why do an entire breakout session at a conference to say, hey, guys, if the Bible is clear, why is there's all these denominations? He could have just done it in five minutes because we're humans and pervasive interpretive pluralism is the way we operate in the church. Being saved doesn't change that. All right. Can't go break out. Go to another session. I mean, I, like I, it just seems like a crazy approach. Rational actors who are just very dispassionately. No, we bring our agendas. We bring things that we want to prove. We bring our own biases, of course. I, I, I subscribe, I've said before, to a Roman Catholic journal. It's very thoughtful. There's lots of helpful things in there. But I, I've subscribed to that for 10 or 20 years now. And I, I've read all sorts of pieces where they'll have two views from Roman Catholics, one a number of years ago, on immigration reform and what we should view as Christians and how we should view immigration and they went arguing through different papal encyclicals. And this pope said this, and, and this uh, thing with a Latin title said this. And no, but this part of social uh, Catholic teaching says this. And you know what it was? It was pervasive, interpretive pluralism. It's not just a Protestant issue. I would argue uh, that when you just go one step further, you have a magisterium, you've then removed the problem from we're arguing about texts of Scripture to then we're fundamentally arguing about texts from the magisterium. And the quotes were this encyclical versus this encyclical. And let me just give uh, a little warning to those of you who are like me, Presbyterians, confessional folks, you love your confessions, you love the Westminster divines, We don't want to fall into the same trap where all we know how to do is debate Book of Church Order versus Book of Church Order or Westminster Confession versus Westminster Confession, and we've taken a step away and we don't even know our Bibles anymore. So pervasive interpretive pluralism. You could say we got a magisterium, we have a pope, we have a final authority. It will not solve the problem. And even though there may be one mother church, so to speak, in the Catholic tradition, When you begin to know and and read some of the literature and have Catholic friends and family members, you realize that there is every bit as much disagreement and diversity within the church. So we must recognize that this is a human problem. Seventh. And we'll stop right there. We got 20 minutes, 14 left, I believe. 20 minutes and 14 seconds left. 20 minutes, if I said 20 minutes and 14 minutes, 20 minutes and 14 seconds left. And I apologize for how we had to do this today. Uh, we spent now basically four hours <laughs> to do one broadcast uh, because uh, everything happened. Hopefully that all flowed together pretty nicely other than all of my explanations. Um, hopefully that worked, but 
I look, I, I don't know how you feel about the fact that, hey, the Bible is absolutely clear, but hey, guess what, guys? Pervasive, interpretive pluralism is just the norm. So don't really be bothered by it. Don't really worry about it. Don't really worry about it, Christians. The Bible is still clear. So the Bible is clear, but it doesn't, that doesn't matter because we have pervasive interpretive pluralism. Like basically what he's saying is, hey, the Bible is absolutely clear, but we're no better off than lost people. Because pervasive interpretive pluralism is just as much a Christian disease as it is an agnostic or an atheist disease. It's just as much a Protestant disease as it is, it's a Catholic disease. So it's a disease with no solution and no, no possible fix. Yet he's still going to say, you better baptize babies because he's a Presbyterian. He's still going to say Presbyterians are right. But wait a minute. You've just argued that pervasive interpretive pluralism is a problem everywhere. So how do you know you're right then? Well, the Bible is clear. Well, what, no, you think it's clear, but pervasive interpretive pluralism is the norm. And if you think that you, you could be wrong, who's right? That is just a weird way to answer the problem. Hey, guys, that's just the way it is. Don't worry about it. Just, just walk around telling everyone they're wrong. I, I don't know. You, you, you can determine how to process that. All right, we're going to stop right there. Please email me all your thoughts about this, st- this mini series on is scripture clear? How do you deal with all of these issues? How do you deal with all of these frustrations? Because at least for me, look, look, I, 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 I'm going to try to end this series when we're done by offering maybe, I, I think there's some practical things we can do. I really do think there's some practical things we can do. I really, really do. But you can't get Christians to agree on those practical steps. But I, I just feel like that there's some practical things we could do. I'm not saying it would fix everything, but it should bring us somewhat closer. But he's not offered, no, nothing practical here. There's no, I mean, it's just all this circular reasoning. Hey, you can't, the Bible's not going to be clear to you unless you study church history. But if you study church history, then you got to use the Bible to judge that church history. Well, if I got to use the Bible to judge the church history, then how is the church history helping me understand the Bible? Because I'm going to be using the Bible in order to, so is the Bible clear or not? I, I don't know. It's just all over the place. But email me, newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. I know we did a lot of kind of repeating of what we did in part two. Not a lot. I added a lot of different perspectives here, but I'm just really trying to drive some of this home, mainly because I just want Christians to acknowledge the reality of the situation, because I think Christians are so arrogant thinking, well, I know what it means. Yeah. Okay. Do you? Because nobody else seems to agree with you. So how do, how do we understand that? All right. Thanks for listening. Everyone have a great, great, great day. We'll be doing more live broadcasting soon. It's like 175 degrees currently here in the study. So I am going to turn on the, uh, the air conditioning unit behind me. Uh, so that I can cool it off a little bit. And maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm going to take a break. I don't know what I'm going to do, but we're going to, we're, we're going to make the best use of this day before it's all said and done. So just be looking for more live broadcasts coming soon. Thanks for listening. Everyone have a great day. God bless.